Good morning. We do want to welcome you here again this day to this uh, webcast and our live streaming for our worship services here at Westside. We're grateful for this opportunity for us to be able to come into your home and to bring God's word to you. I want to thank you all very much for your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings. We are blessed as a church to be able to keep on keeping on and and the work of the church continues to move forward as our missionaries and the people that we support uh, in, locally as, as in state and around the world are able to continue their work. I want to encourage you, please continue to be checking on one another, to be praying for one another and bringing care uh, needs to us uh, and, and through our you know, text messaging and, and stuff like that. We're able to just keep a track of one another and we want to be able to meet needs as, as they come our way. And so we, we just ask that you continue to do just what you're doing. Appreciate so much this body and their love for one another and our love for the Lord. Let's start this day off with a word of prayer. Father, we just ask your blessing to be upon our time together. We thank you, Father, for this privilege and it's ours to be able to come together via technology to open your word. And we pray, Lord, that you'll just be a blessing and a challenge uh, to us that you'll give us eyes to ear and ears, eyes to see and ears to hear as we strive to open your word. Forgive us again, Father, when we fail you, and help us always to keep our eyes focused and fixed on Jesus, for it's in his name we do pray. Amen. There was a friend of mine who uh, was a guest preacher in a church in Las Vegas, and it was an early Sunday morning, and he pulls out from the, the motel, and he is pulled over for drunk driving. Now, my friend Tom, first off, you need to know Tom wasn't drunk. I mean, he won't even take NyQuil. Secondly, he was staying in a motel that was behind a casino. And so when he pulled out uh, of a casino early in the morning, that was a sign for the police officer to pull him over. And third thing you need to understand is he should have been driving a Dodge Stratus at the time. See, the, that was the car that he had rented when he got there, but he decided he wanted to try to, to get that free upgrade to a convertible, which really wasn't difficult to do because it was 114 degrees in the shade and nobody wanted a convertible. Everybody wanted the air-conditioned cars. And so anyhow, he's driving with the top down in this canary yellow Mustang convertible and he pulls out of the casino trying to follow directions to get him to the church and he's pulled over as he sees the lights and hears the sirens behind him and then the officer coming to the front of the car and just saying do you know why I pulled you over and Tom goes no sir I, I really don't and he said I pulled you over for drunk driving and so Tom starts laughing which wasn't the appropriate response for the officer uh, he said this is no laughing matter son uh, this is, you know, not, not funny. And he was starting to get upset. And, and so he, he uh, got all of, uh, kind of in a panic because he goes, you know, this could go wrong real easy. And so he was trying to explain to him, himself. He says, hey, I, I'm just a guest in this town. I'm on my way to preach at a church down the street. Then he realized that's exactly what a drunk person would say. <laughs> And so he, he takes down his information and he goes to his car and, and this officer's not happy at all. And you know what Tom was doing as he sat in that yellow canary convertible Mustang? You got it. He was praying. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Maybe your prayer life only shows up when you are in trouble. It, it's kind of like that, that sign on a fire, fire hydrant that says emergency purposes only. And if life isn't going well, that's when we, we start to pray. But otherwise, it, it's just a sentence or two, maybe before a meal, or a short prayer before we fall asleep at night. What's interesting is that most everyone would, would theoretically agree that prayer should be a priority in our lives. But practically speaking, many of us really have a hard time working this and making this as a priority that it should be in our life. I mean, I don't know why that is. I mean, I think there's a number of reasons. Maybe it's because we're just busy. Our intentions are good, but, you know, we know this is important. And I think there are a lot of people who start off praying, and then they, they start thinking of something else, and they lose their focus, or they are intimidated by a prayer uh, that somebody else 
they hear saying, and they're just not sure where to start. Maybe they're intimidated about the whole subject of prayer. But I've come to discover that an overwhelming answer as to why we don't pray is because most people feel that like that prayer is boring. Now I don't, I, I don't know how that makes makes any sense. I mean, I mean, we're talking to the God uh, of all creation, the God of the universe. Why would that ever be boring? But I do understand because if I'm honest with myself and you're honest with yourself, I, I think we could say we understand. Because the number one reason that you or I don't pray as often as we should is because we don't feel like it. Sometimes I don't just feel like it. And I mean, let's be honest. We're not used to talking about prayer in a very authentic way because we feel that this is an area of our life that we really ought to have all together. And the truth is, it's an area where many Christians struggle. So here is my prayer as we begin to start this new series on uh, our networking with God in, in prayer. Here's my prayer is that over the next couple of weeks, we will move from a theoretical discussion about prayer to being a people who really pray. Not because we have to, but because we want to. You know, one of the purposes of this church and, and all of our churches is to connect people to Jesus and to one another. And then we say, when we say connect, I, I think we know what that word means and we know and, and can understand it, whether it's through emails or text messages or cell phone calls. But here's a question. How strong is your connection to God? Because if you're a Christian, you're part of this this incredible network where the God of all heaven is available to talk to. And so it's my prayer that our connection would be strong and it would strengthen in the weeks ahead. And here's the point. See, we don't, we don't want to just talk about prayer for a few weeks. I really want us to pray. We want to move past the theoretical discussion. And if at the end uh, of three weeks of, of talking about this and all we've, all we've learned is, is a lot about prayer, then we've really missed the point. And, and so I want to challenge you, whether you've been a Christian for most of your life or, or you're just starting with your walk with God, I really want to challenge you to talk to him. Talk to him like you've never talked to him before and examine your connection. Let's really make an effort to connect with him like we never have before. In Matthew chapter 6, the text we're going to be using that today, Jesus is talking uh, about how to pray. I saw a survey that was done recently in This Week magazine. And the question is, people who go to church were asked this question. And the question was, what do you most need to hear your minister talk about at church? What do you need to hear most about? And the number one answer was how to make my prayer life more effective. In Matthew 6, we have the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's also given to us in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke actually tells us how Jesus came to teach us to pray, to teach on prayer. And it happened this way. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know what? That's the only time in the ministry of Jesus that his disciples say, teach us to do something. You know, they never said, teach us to do miracles, Lord. They, they never said, teach us how to teach. They, they never said, Lord, hey, would you do this leadership seminar over there for us? It's the only time they say, teach us to do something. And it's a little ironic that they're asking about prayer. Because you see, these were Jewish boys. And Jewish boys were taught to pray. And I mean, prayer would have been a daily part of their life. life and, and yet they saw somehow this something in this connection that Jesus had. That's a, a network that they wanted to be a part of. And so they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches them to pray. And he gives them this model prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer. But before we study this particular prayer, I want us to 
put it into context because Jesus, I think, wants us to understand that, that all of this is contingent upon a, a genuine relationship with him. In verse 5, he, he says, And when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into the room, close your door, pray to your Father, who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, when we pray, oftentimes we slip this into some kind of mode where we try to pretend that we are something that we really aren't. And I, I'm really not sure if that's an effort on our part to try to impress those that are around us because we think that we're supposed to, to do that or if that's what we think that God really wants. But the most consistent teaching in the New Testament is this. Be real. Be authentic. Be yourself. God wants us just to be ourselves around Him. To know that, we can talk to Him. We can talk to Him at any, about anything. We can talk to Him at, at any time. And we don't have to worry how it comes out. We can just, so many times we get caught up in, in what we're saying and, and we're not talking straight and, and sincere and open with God. Have you ever listened to somebody who prays and they're just good at it? You know, they're, they're praying and you're listening and, and they're saying something and, and in your mind you're thinking, wow, that's really good. I think I'm going to add that to my prayer repertoire. <laughs> you know, so the next time you are praying, you kind of uh, copycat their prayer. And and then you're you're like, Lord, lead, guide, and direct us. And, and, and then, you know, you're saying, bless the gift and the giver. Or you're saying, uh, and bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Or, or maybe you might say, uh, God... Give them traveling mercies. Now, it, there's nothing wrong with saying those things if that's the way you really talk to God. But God just wants us to be real. He wants us to, to know that, that we can talk to Him and be ourselves. And listen to what He says in verse 7 and 8. This is paraphrased. He says, But don't recite the same prayer over and over again as the heathens do who pray like prayers are answered only by repeating them again and again. But remember, your father knows exactly what you need before you ask him. For many of his listeners, prayer had become very formal. Prayer had become lifeless. Prayer had become a ritual where they just kind of said the same thing over and over again. And that's true for, for many Jews. And they had, as an example, a, a prayer that they would say every day, and it was the, the Shema. And they would say that around 9 o'clock in the morning, and then they would say it again at 9 p.m. at night. And if they got to be 9 o'clock and they hadn't said the prayer, then they stopped whatever they would do, and they would say the Shema. Now, I'm sure some of them were very, very sincere. But for many of them, they were just reciting words. And, and, and they were just doing it out of duty. They were doing it out of, uh, out of obligation. And they had all kinds of prayer in their culture that, that they could say for different things and different times. And they had prayers before they washed their hands. And they had prayers before they ate their food. And they had prayers for when they went to a new town. And, and when they left an old town. When, when the sun rose. When the sun set. All kinds of prayer. And, and they had them memorized. And Jesus says, don't say the same thing over and over again. You know, in that culture, the effectiveness of prayer was directly thought to be related to the length of prayer. And some people would just ramble on and on and on. And when Jesus comes and he teaches on prayer, he teaches in a very different way, which we would expect Jesus to do. And it's very simple. He says, you talk to God like you, you talk to somebody that you love. And it's in that context 
that we want to study this Lord's Prayer, this model prayer in Matthew 6. And already there is a really important lesson for us. See, the Lord's Prayer is a pattern for us to practice. It's not a prayer to perform. In other words, you don't want to turn the Lord's Prayer into a Shema, where, where God says, this is how you should pray. And then all of a sudden, everybody just says the Lord's Prayer as, as, as their prayer. It's a pattern. It's an example. It's a model. A model that we can look at. A model that we can follow. But, but we say it in our own words. So I want us to study this prayer together. And in verse 9, we pick up Jesus saying, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. See, when Jesus was, was asked to teach on prayer, he doesn't go into some 30 or 45 minute lecture. What he does is he prays. And the best way for you and I to learn to pray is to pray. And the more we pray, the more natural prayer becomes. And I think it's a lot like uh, many times we have a hard time because we just don't know where to start. And our prayers are kind of unbalanced. And so we lose focus. And so I want us to examine this prayer and let, let's see how we can put these things into practice. See, the Lord's Prayer we, begins with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This prayer begins with this first word, adoration. Adoration. It, it begins the saying, God, you are worthy. God, I love you. God, I praise you because... And that's really important part of prayer that sometimes we never get to because we're so focused on ourselves. Sometimes we never get around to it because we're so focused on our challenges. Sometimes we're so focused on our, our, our problems. But when adoration is the beginning point, the starting point of our prayer time, it takes our focus off of us and puts it on God. And as we do that, it puts our problems in proper perspective, because then we realize that nothing that we're dealing with is too big for him. You know, there are all kinds of things that we can pray to God and thank him for and praise him for. We can praise him because he is all powerful in Exodus 14. And also in, in Joshua 3, God sees that certain seas and rivers need to be parted. And that's what he does. In Exodus 16 and in John 6, he sees that people need to have food to eat. And so he drops food from heaven and he provides food for, uh, from fish and bread for a, a multitude to eat. In Mark 4, a storm was threatening Jesus' his followers and he just stills the storm. And in Joshua 10, the people of Israel, they need more time in the day so that they can fight the battle. And so God extends the day. Maybe you just adore God for his power. Maybe we praise him because of his mercy. Maybe we adore him because of his justice, for his grace, for his loving kindness, or, or just to Spend time adoring God and it puts everything else into perspective. You know, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is also teaching on praying. He says, if you believe and you don't doubt, you can say to this mountain over here, throw yourself into the sea and it'll do it. And he's talking about the importance of having faith, believing in our prayers. You know, I think most of us want that. We tend to do just that, you know, to focus on those mountains. And we see all those mountains. However, when we start adoring God and start adoring the Lord, it takes our focus on the mount, off the mountains and it puts us uh, our focus on the mountain mover. Maybe you find yourself standing in the shadow of a mountain. Maybe you're kind of thinking that's the way it is with this COVID-19. Maybe it's some habit that you're trying to break or it's some temptation you're trying to overcome. 
Maybe it's a family problem or a financial crisis that you're having to deal with or a health problem. The mountain just seems overwhelming and you're praying for it to move. But first, quick looking at what's in front of you and start looking at the one who is above you. And when we talk to God, adore him, praise him, recognize his greatness. The next part of this prayer, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the word affirmation. And this is where we say to God, God, I affirm that what I want in my life and for this world is for your will to be done. Before we go to God, we say, here are all sorts of things that I want. And we treat him like he's a shopping list. I, I really want this in my life. But when we affirm, we're saying, Lord, what I want is your will in our lives. But we've got to understand, sometimes his will isn't what we want. And that's why Jesus had that simple prayer when he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Sometimes I skip that part. I forget to tell God, hey, uh, what I really want is, is your will to be done. And I just kind of start telling him what my will is. And then later I discover that my will was completely wrong. See, first we affirm what, what we want is that God's will be done in our lives. Maybe that's a prayer that, that some of you need to pray. You know, God, I'm in a lot of pain right now. And, and I know that you have the power to heal me. And I'm just going to trust in your timing. I'm going to put my confidence in you. Lord, your will be done. And then pray for God's kingdom to come here on earth. You know how different this earth would be if God's kingdom would really come? You could actually turn the news on at night and hear stories of kindness and compassion. If God's kingdom would really come, then there would be no need for, for child protective services. There would be no need for divorce lawyers. So pray, God, I want your kingdom to come in my life and on this earth. You know, we just pray through our life and we say, I, I want you to be the God of every area of my life. We affirm his will be done. The third part of this, of this prayer, Jesus simply says, give us today our daily bread. And that word is appeal. There, this is where we go to God and we ask him for help. And we say, God, I need your help in my life. Someone said it's hard to ask God to give us our daily bread when we got a pantry full of loaves. And that's true. Sometimes I think we interpret this to mean, God, here's my Christmas list. If Santa Claus doesn't come through, then it's up to you. You know, we want, we want to just tell him everything that we want. Give me this. I want that. Bless me, Lord, I pray. Give me this. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we want just to tell him that. And that's not what it's talking about here. We go to God with our needs and we ask him to intervene in our lives. See, this can be really hard for some of us because we have a tendency to be very self-sufficient. We have a tendency to be very independent, to be self-reliant. I don't need anybody. But you know what? Prayer flies in the face of those, who, uh, those things. Uh, and, and it says, God, I can't do it without you. I can't do it. I can't make it on my own. I need your help. It requires you to humbly say to God, God, I need your help here. I can't do this without you. And here's what I've noticed. For many of us, we go to great lengths to fix our own problems. We will read self-help books. We will go to counselors. We will talk to friends. We will talk to family members. But we will never, ever, ever go around and ask the God of the universe for help. We never go to God with the problem. And why is that? I'm really not sure. I, I know it's because we, it's not because we haven't been invited. 
Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6, he said, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we go to God and we ask him for help. He's given us permission to. You know, I think one of the reasons why this isn't easy for us is because of our perception of God. You see, when we see God as our father, we are willing to, to go to him. But a lot of us see him as our master. And, and we think of ourselves as slaves. Tom Holiday, a minister who tries to help us understand that when we go to God, he, uh, we, we can approach to him, uh, approach him like, like our children approach us. And, and it's like this. When, when my kids were small and I would walk into the door, I didn't expect my kids to, to come running up to me and say, Oh, omnipotent procreator of our lineage, thou art magnificent in every way. We honor thee graciously who bestows allowances upon us. We beseech thee, come dine with us. We don't do that. No, I, I'm a father. As a father, I love to meet their needs. I love to take care of them. And so they ask, I want to do my best. James 4.2 says we don't have because we don't ask God. You know, I really think the heart of why we don't take this more seriously is the question, do you really believe that prayer works? We say we do. Everyone immediately will think, yes, of course, it's true. But if, if it is true, then we really, and we really believe that then something, it, it seems that there would then be nothing that we would not ask God and pray to God for to help us in our lives. You know, there's only one time in the Bible where God actually tells someone not to pray. At least that one time that I could find. And, and that was when he was talking to Jeremiah and actually tells Jeremiah three times, don't pray, stop praying. I mean it, stop praying. And here's why. Jeremiah was praying that God would, would not punish a nation that he was very evil and that God did not want Jeremiah changing his mind. So he told him three times, you stop praying. And four times in scripture, we read that God changed his mind and he took a different course of action because he was asked. Do you really believe prayer works? You know, when we appeal, we don't just pray for ourselves. No, actually, we're asking God to intervene in the lives of, of people who are around us in needs that we know of. And if you look through all the prayers of Jesus in Scripture, there's only one time that he prayed for himself. One time when he said, Lord, take this cup from me. Every other time, it was for other people. You know, we go to God and we appeal. We ask Him to intervene. And maybe it's, it's some area of our life where we need God's help. Maybe it, it's someone else's. But if you can't think of someone to pray for, ask God, Lord, bring someone to my mind. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And he'll do just that. The last part of this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those, uh, our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The word here is apology. Apology. We go to God and we confess our sins and we say, God, I need your forgiveness. God, I, I need your forgiveness. I mean, and this can be very difficult for some of us to do. But it is an essential part to have that genuine relationship. I mean, have you ever been with someone and had somebody in your life and they hurt you? They hurt you bad and, and, and they do something against you. And, and, and then the next time you're around them, they pretend as though nothing ever happened. And they act, they act like everything's OK. You know, it's very hard to have an authentic relationship with somebody like that. That is exactly what we do to God. For there to be a real relationship, the offense needs to be acknowledged. Forgiveness needs to be sought. 
And the same is true, see, here in our relationship with God. Sometimes it's so hard to say, God, here's what I've done wrong. God, I'm sorry. And yet God is just waiting for us to acknowledge what is between He and us. He already knows, but He wants us to acknowledge it. He wants us to confess it. He wants us to seek forgiveness. And what does Jesus say? He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Part of confession is saying, God, I need your strength in this area. I want to do better so that I can honor you with this area of my life as well. And as you sit there listening to me, maybe you can just confess to God and seek His forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we come to You as a church family and we honor You. You are a great God. Your power, Your wisdom, we can't even begin to comprehend. And Lord, I, I know I'm not alone, that there are are many people who probably haven't made prayer a priority like they should have. And maybe even, even folks that might be listening here today, despite themselves, they find themselves looking at their watch and just wondering, okay, how much longer? But God, you, the creator of the world, the giver and the sustainer of life, I pray that you would just lean forward with an ear toward us Who are we that, that we should even you should even give us attention? Lord, we, we just praise you because we are you are all knowing and you're all powerful, and we just affirm that we want you. Want you in our lives. Father, we acknowledge that you know what's best for us. And sometimes we think we we know, Lord, but we know and want your will to be done. Not our will, but yours. And I know, Father, it takes a lot of faith to pray for something to happen in our lives, but it takes even more faith to say, God, I want your will to be done. And that is our prayer, Father. That's our prayer for, for this series. Lord, I, I know that there are a lot of who uh, have appeals that, that have gone before you even here this morning. And I know that, that you care about each and every one. People that need your help. And I know, Father, that there are a lot of different hurts and there are a lot of different concerns. And we just want to bring them to you, God, and ask that you would intervene because we just don't know what to do. And so many things are just out of our control, like this whole COVID-19 thing. Lord, I just confess my sins to you. I confess that oftentimes, Lord, when I prayed, I, I prayed because I wanted to be impressive to even people I don't know. And Father, I, I just confess any pride that I've had this week. I confess being impatient. I confess getting angry. This week, I, I, I've been selfish. And Lord, I am sorry. Would you please forgive me? And would you give me the strength to do better? so that in those areas of my life, that they would be areas that I would honor and glorify you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen. You know, I know that there are people who are listening, people who've been praying, praying for a lot of years, praying that there would be some time praying that there would be some place where maybe a loved one that's just been a burden on our heart would stop living life on their own and they would just turn everything over to God. The greatest prayer that can be prayed this morning is if someone would say, God, I just want to surrender my life over to you and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I want to make him the Lord and master of my life. And if that is is 
something that needs to happen in your life, we invite you to contact us. You can contact us via the church website at, at westsidechristian.church. And, and you can contact us and we will be visiting you, helping you, trying to help you make that most important decision in all the world, leading you, guiding you in direction of obedience so that you can be baptized into Christ, buried in that water grave to arise to walk in newness of life. You can contact me or one of the elders. We'd be more than happy. We'd just love the opportunity to visit with you about Jesus. This morning, we want to conclude our time together as we uh, have a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper together. And I'd like to read a meditation for us this day as before we partake of the elements. Professor longtime professor and preacher, founder of those Ozark Christian College, Seth Wilson, explains how we gain new life through accepting Jesus' death. And he writes, God declares that Christ died for my sins and I must accept his death as a, the evidence of God's love. I must accept his death as God's provision for my own death as the sentence I deserve and turn my, my own life over to Jesus. If Jesus gave me his death and I give him my life, then it's a fair exchange. If I accept his death as mine so that my death is past, then he died my death. And it is no more my life that I live, but Christ lives in me. I'm united with him so that God sees him in me because he now lives in me and sees me in him then you can see how God is just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. This morning as we break this bread and we take this cup, help us to remember what Jesus, is, Jesus did for us and his dying for us. Father, we just pray that as we take these emblems, that this morning that it would be for us a reminder of what Jesus did and accomplished for us at the cross. Thank you so much for loving us. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. We pray that this week has been a blessing to you in your life. And we just ask that God would go with you as you go throughout your day, go throughout your week, please stay healthy. And as you practice social distancing and uh, continue to be the body of Christ to all you come in contact with. May the Lord bless you. Have a great day.